Okay, my name is Steve Rosted. I am um, work for VMware. I'm one of the open source developers there. And uh, I'm, one of the, I'm an original developer, maintainer of something called F-Trace, which is a, a trace, the official tracing utility of the Linux kernel. I've uh, also worked on the real-time patch. Actually, that's where F-Trace came from, is from our work in, um, trying to make Linux into our real-time, which hopefully will go in this year. Um, uh, back in 2009, I created a tool to visualize um, the trace data uh, because I was um, debugging the real-time scheduler and uh, the migration of it, and I needed a good way to visualize stuff. So I, my first introduction into open source development was back in 1996, where I sent a patch to GTK uh, back then. So I liked GTK, but I haven't done it for over a decade. So I, I used it as both, hey, I'll make a visualization, I'll learn how to use GTK, and I, I worked on it, and it became my hobby. It was more of a hobby uh, task. When I went to VMware, um, Dirk Hondo, who was the vice president of our department, asked me if there's anything that I would like to work on that VMware could help out with, and I said, yes, kernel card. I haven't really been able to work on it. I've been, like I said, it was my idle task. So I, we hired Jordan, I'm gonna butcher his name, but uh, Kotterdorf? Uh, he keeps fixing my pronunciation of it, and I have to get it right. Uh, anyway, uh, Jordan uh, came in. He worked. He's actually a. Uh, he was a uh, theoretical physicist at CERN, and he was doing more programming than physics, and found out he liked programming more. So that's why he left CERN to become a programmer. Uh, he did a lot of development uh, at, uh, data analysis and stuff like that, and he did a lot of things with Qt. Qt. And I said, perfect, because when I wrote Kernel Chart, I cornered myself into a corner with the design decision, because I really, like I said, I was only working on it when I had some free time. I didn't really put that much thought in the development of it. And I made several poor design decisions, and that's why Kernel Chart never made it to 1.0, because it was, I wanted to rewrite it. Now I had someone that had experience and said, great, if you're going to rewrite it, I helped architecture, make sure he didn't fall into the same traps I fell into. He rewrote it from scratch in Q and C++ using the, still the, the trace command engines, and this is how we got kernel chart 1.0. And just before all those of you with little kids, I have to do it. Kernel chart 2.0. 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 It goes on too. <laughs> and finally, also one last thing. Uh, I did try to do it in my last session, so I have to do it now. I always take selfies. Uh, hope you don't mind. Um, this is called a camera. <laughs> I don't make phone calls with this. <laughs> Smile. Okay. Um, I'll post it up somewhere. Next. So, let's continue. Is this thing going? Maybe I'll turn it on. So, Colonel Shark. What is it? It's a front end graphical user interface for trace command. What is trace command? Um, well, it's a front end uh, command line interface for F-Trace. And what is F-Trace? Anyone here not know what F-Trace is? So everyone here actually know what F-Trace is? Wow, it's actually being unpopular. It's actually, this is, this is several times a lot of people say, no, I have no idea what F-Trace is. But I kind of gave you a definition, so technically you would, everyone that was here when I gave my introduction knows what F-Trace is. Um, where is it? It's on uh, getthatkernel.org. Uh, that's where it's located. It currently lives with Trace Command in the same Git repository, but what we're working on right now is we're trying to make uh, Trace Command into a library, a bunch of libraries, such that we can move Kernel Shark into its own repo, and Yordan will then become the main maintainer of it once that happens. So, what does it look like? So, when you start up uh, Kernel Shark for the very first time, this is what it looks like. No big deal. Um, by the way, I made this mostly visuals. Uh, you click on tools, you click on record. This is actually one of the, it's, the old one did this, but this is a little bit better. Uh, the little color scheme thing, uh, I'll show that for me again. You click on that. So basically, you now could be, you could do this from the user, and it'll ask you to be root. Um, it will execute a smaller program, so it's a little bit easier to audit, because you know, when you write things that super user and root could use, you want to make sure it's kind of condensed uh, so that no one um, can take advantage of it and hack into your system because of a security hole or something. So the, uh, we try to keep the recorder much smaller. And this is what actually what it looks like. And you can actually run this by itself, but you need to be root to do anything because this actually reads into the Linux kernel directories 
that are protected that only root can read into, and that's how it produces all the events that F trace shows you. So if I can go and select, select certain you know trace events uh, here, and by the way, later on today I am giving a tutorial on F trace. So if you don't know anything about F trace, I am giving a tutorial later today. Probably should have done that first and then have this. But I, I'm not in charge of the schedule. So I clicked on a few things here, and then down below, um, I hit it. And you can see, let's see if this thing actually reads. Ah, you can't see. So right here, you can actually put in where you want the output. You can put in a command that's going to run. If I hit apply first, let's get into that here. No, I didn't show it. Um, you can see it does the trace, it actually executes trace command record um, with. Uh, the events that I, the, the system events I did, I didn't do any individual events. I hit capture and then it recorded the, the thing. And then what happens is it pops up with the data. So you get all this, and what you see here is um, per CPU, uh, all the data uh, in the visual. On the CPU side, each different color happens to be a different task. So you can see how things are scheduled. If there's some, if it's blank, that means the system is idle. Uh, if you see a black line with nothing in it, that means the idle task, because the idle task itself, when the system is idle, can actually do events. Uh, interrupts can come in where there's no actual task. Uh, that would be a little black line. But here you can see the different events on each line. Down below here is this, this is basically an output. If you did just trace command report, it would show you all the output. And you can look in here, and you can search um, within that. So, we want to zoom in because right now you can't really do it. So, you just select your mouse, slide it across, it gives you this little grid, and when you let go of the mouse, it zooms right in. So, if I go back, this part from here to here becomes that window. So, that's what you see. That was inside that little box. So, you can get down to a little bit deeper. Um, if you put the mouse over uh, events, you see the mouse over here, I put over event, you can read up on top that this was my Chromium uh, uh, task. On CPU zero, this little magic numbers here is the same thing as the latency. Now that's something I probably should document a little better. I think I described it in my uh, documentation. You do have, like the first one means interrupts are disabled, the D. Uh, the dot, uh, I can't remember what the yeah, dot would be, but the next one would be the, the capital N, which means that uh, in, uh, there's a need reset sched flag set. So in your, inside the kernel, what could happen is an event could come up and say, look, we need to schedule. So like, there's another task that wants to run that's higher priority than the task that you're running right now. So we set a flag saying we need to do a schedule so that when we enable interrupts, we know that we got to call the schedule. So that's why you'll see here where the H means we're in a hard interrupt as opposed to a soft interrupt, two different things. Uh, and then down, the last one, I believe, it might be a preempt count. I have to look at it because different kernels have different information what that shows. So when I click on that event, you'll see a little dot here. This is one of the advantages, or this is one of the enhancements from Kernel Shark 1.0 that the old, old one didn't have, is that it actually, this little dot will appear on the event. So if I actually move across, you'll see the dot, dot will bounce to which actual event it corresponds. Because before you just saw a line, you didn't really know which CPU that, you had to actually look here to see which CPU it was to see it was. So on marker A, I click marker A here, it gives me the timestamp, same timestamp up there, and it gives me a little spot there. So, if I hit this double plus plus, I zoom all the way in, as far as it could go. So I can come, if I want to see all the, see everything there, and then I hit marker B, it gives me a separate second marker. So I want to see what's over here to over here. So I want to say this guy, which happened to be a sked waking, and it was waking this compositor, whatever that was, I think it's some, uh, I think it's one of the uh, threads from the Chromium task. And but I just curiously, I want to see how long it took to wake up. So right there, I said, okay, this is where it woke up. That's the sked waking task, or sked waking event. The sked switch event here shows you that the compositor was uh, scheduled onto the CPU. And you notice it started right there. Now, here's a little interesting. I, I like showing bugs on the board, or on my case. <laughs> because as I write these things, I find bugs. Usually, I always find bugs when I'm writing uh, presentations. And I kind of list them up, and this is uh, this way I can keep it on here. Remember, okay, you are I found some bugs, and I'll, re I'll report. Um, since this is kind of like a design decision that Jordan chose, I, we were like questionable whether we like this. Uh, the sked event is kind of um, an interesting event because it represents two tasks. You have right here, it's the idle task that is scheduling 
the composite path. And that's where the composite um, thread starts. But because I'm here, it's really the idle path that's actually the task here. Now, the reason why I'm saying that, I think of this is, so I click down here, this is where the bug was, was it get events kind of screw things up? Because now I do a right click, I get this menu, I want to plot the task. But right here, it's kind of funny because it says idle, but it, let me see what it says, right? You can see in there. This is where the bug is. It's saying it's the idle with process ID 13482. I can guarantee you that idle task does not have a process ID of 13482. The idle task has a process ID of zero. So why is that? It's actually showing the process ID of the compositor task, as you can see over here, 14832, or yeah, 13482, but the process uh, idle task is actually process ID zero, but that's kind of got, it's got mixed, and that, that can be confusing. So just to let you know, I, I will probably fix this. The question is, which one should you show right there? Um, but when we add it, you notice that I added the idle task at process ID zero. This is sort of the idle task at process ID zero. Now, what's interesting about this, you know, idle task is a little confusing because there's really actually more than one idle task. Um, the, the idle task is kind of magic in the kernel because there's, um, it runs on every single CPU. So where everything else is a single entity, idle is magical. There's, uh, there's a magic idle for every single CPU and they all have to share the same process ID. So that does sometimes confuse kernel shard because it's expecting every thread with the same single process ID is going to be the same. So what's interesting about the, uh, when you pl plot a task, the task color is now, remember I told you on the CPU, each color was which CPU it was on? The task color represents which CPU, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, CPU is telling you which task, each color is a different task. On a task plot, these are task plots, these are CPU plots. On a task plot, each color is a different CPU, so you can watch things migrate. So I could click on the right screen and scroll further out over. And as I scrolled over, let's see, where is right here? And yeah, so because now I'm more interested into seeing the events of actual the compositor task. So I click there, and now I actually got the real name followed by the real PID. And there I want to add that guy. So now I got this task, and now I can see something more interesting. Here's something that's really kind of interesting that Trace um, Command actually does, or Curl Shark actually does. And it's actually a plugin. I forgot to, I don't think I should talk about that here, but I'll show it in the demo. But the plugin that we added is a scheduling wake up plugin, a scheduling plugin that modifies how scheduling events work. And that's probably why I got a little confused too, because that's actually a plugin that did it. <clears throat> so you'll notice this green box here. When I plot tasks, it this green box shows me that this is where it was woken up, this is where it actually was scheduled. So actually I can see from here, I can click on click on marker A, click up here where the uh, wake up is on this guy, go, okay, scheduled waking. And I can go over to marker B, click marker B, click that, and between the two, you get the wake-up latency. So that's a 48, so between the time of woken up to the time of scheduled was 48 microseconds. Now, this is another enhancement that Jordan did, I actually thought this was kind of cool, because I didn't, I never thought about this, was that he actually put spaces between in there so it, you could see which is the milliseconds, which are the microseconds, which are the nanoseconds. And that's kind of uh, nice to see. So, let's see, let's go back to, let's do something a little bit more interesting, I guess. Um, let's see, I don't know what this was. I clicked on the capture, oh, yes, that's what I did. Where's the mouse, did I not put the mouse? Ah, I think I did the mouse. Okay, I think I did it, you get import and export settings. Um, when I did a lot of these screenshots, you know, you have to remember to hit, you know, do you want to uh, select the mouse or not? So usually I would say select the mouse to show you what I'm clicking on. I forgot to do that in this one, because it was supposed to have an uh, arrow on my export settings. Because then you come up with this, and I say, okay, I want to save my settings. And you can actually, so in other words, if you have something, if you've got really complex settings, you can always save all your stuff there. Um, and then I can run import settings, and this time I'm going to run something different. I'm going to do um, exceptions, and or I'm going to do exceptions, I do this, I'm going to actually see what I did. Schedule events, boom. I called this guy migrate. It's, this is the actual code that I wrote back in 2009 to debug the uh, real-time scheduler. What it did was it created a bunch of tasks, more than the number of CPUs, each one had a different priority, and then it executed them, and each, like the, the highest priority task would just run at a very quick, uh, interval, it would just run for a little bit and then go off, run a little bit, go off, run a little bit, go off, run a little bit, go off. 
Uh, the next task would, at a lower priority, slightly lower priority, would run at a little bit longer uh, um, time, but for a um, longer period. Uh, so it would go off and so on and so forth. And since there's more tasks than CPUs, obviously there's going to be a bouncing around, and I want to make sure that the highest priority tasks migrated the least. And it wasn't happening. It was like things were going crazy. So I actually did this to record, and then I got to watch things. So when I record this, this is what you got. This whole huge, uh, all these tasks. Very pretty uh, picture. So I, now I only want to see, what, is it events? Yes. No, I actually clicked on the wrong thing. It's supposed to be show tasks. I don't care about the events. They're supposed to be on the show tasks. It's one of those things, like I said, you have five seconds to pick the thing down. So although I think I thought I was on show tasks, I think when the screenshot happened, I didn't verify it. <laughs> so it was actually supposed to be, go back here. That's a mistake. That should have been on show tasks. So I clicked here on all the tasks. And I picked the tasks I want. This is all the migrated tasks. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine tasks for, I guess, us. Uh, Eight more? Yeah, eight CPUs. So now you get this. Um, you see these big gaps here. This is where, the, where they weren't running. Interesting. So what I did was, why are these gaps here? You know, this is a, they're all real-time tasks running, running, running. I'm like, why are these huge gaps here? And what was interesting, I did a marker A, clicked here, marker B, clicked here, and looked at this, and it was pretty much one second. Exactly one second interval. And I checked in here, there's a little tiny thing, and it was, you know, five hundredths of a second. Anyone know why? I think you got it. <clears throat> RG throttle rate is enabled. Uh, if you go into your cat proc system, uh, there's two files, or two, yeah, two files in Proxys kernel that control your system. This is in microseconds, so that's what the little US there. And, you know, one million microseconds is one second, so a period of one second. And this is saying that real time tasks are about, allowed to run 950 uh, milliseconds for every second. So if you go back, that's 950 milliseconds for every second, and you can actually see the visual because the migrate task basically pounds onto the system. Uh, RT throttling comes up. In fact, actually, when I did a demessage graphic, you get this little message. Okay, so let's look. Try to do a little bit more real work. <clears throat> so I took the RT patch, um, one of the more recent ones. Although we're at five two now. <clears throat> But I found out when I ran this test, 5.2 crashed on me, so I had to go back to 5.0. And I enabled config no hertz full. Um, anyone knows what config no hertz full is? Anyone here knows what config no hertz is? Excuse me. Okay, uh, okay. I'm going to explain, explain this. This is a really interesting thing. You should be running all your machines with config no hertz. That's definite. Um, <clears throat> basically, what no hertz means is when you have, are familiar with the Hertz, you have a timer tick for a Jiffy. If, if you know anything about the Linux kernel, we define everything by a Jiffy. A Jiffy is defined at compile time, either um, 1,000, like it could be uh, 1,000 Hertz, so a Jiffy is every millisecond. Uh, it's how the scheduler kind of uses to figure out how to uh, block how much time each task should get. So it's how you can define it. Some of them is like 250, micro, uh, 250 Hertz. I can't do the calculation right now in my head, but whatever that is. Uh, so 250 times a second, uh, you'll have this little tick going off that defines, this defines also your usage. Ever do a time, run, run time on a process, or like, you know, time command, and it shows you user time, system time, all that. That's defined by the tick. So it actually isn't really calculating the actual time. It's a general thing. The more, the higher your hertz is, the higher your, um, or the more precise those values will be. The problem with the tick is it's interrupting the kernel. It's, you're going on, you're going to get this interrupt at that hertz. So if you have a thousand hertz, so a thousand times a second, your uh, computer is going to be shooting off the tick to do some time calculations. Well, what happens when you want your machine to go to sleep? If, you're, if your machine is idle and the tick still goes off, so your CPU will never get into a slow, uh, a small sleep state. Years ago, this has actually been in the kernel for some time, we have this thing called no hertz. 
the thing no burns, which means that when the system goes idle, it turns to tick off. And then when the when the, your machine, a real interrupt comes in, besides like no timer, there's no more timer now, something actually comes in, it wakes up, then it looks at the time difference and then injects how many jiffies are supposed to be there. There's a bit of work there because if you have a timer that's based off of the jiffies, you have to make sure that you set the actual timer, you don't just turn off the tick if something's actually expecting it to go off in 100 jiffies. Uh, that's another thing, you say go off at 100 jiffies, do something, you better keep that slot in there, you can't just turn that off. Um, that's no hertz. So everyone should be running with no hertz. I think every uh, distribution compiles that in. So because with no hertz enabled, your system could get into a nice deep, uh, deep sleep, and your battery lasts a lot longer on your laptop. So if you if you turn if you go in there and compile your own kernel, turn off no no hertz, you'll notice that your um, battery will last a lot shorter if you turn off no hertz. No hertz full is something else. This is a real time task thing. Uh, no hertz full means that. If the tick that is there is for scheduling, mostly for scheduling, if you have one task running and no other task is running on that CPU, why do you have a tick? That, in a real, sometimes like real-time people would like to have a task that will mmap a um, device driver information, like say I'm looking at the uh, network card and I want to see when packets come in, I got to respond to packets on the network card immediately. I mean, I need to respond within a microsecond. Now, if you wait for the interrupt to come in, and by the way, if you let no, if you have no hertz enabled, and you're and you're pulling, if you go on to a waiting for the interrupt to come in, and your machine goes asleep, some CPUs could take up to a micro a millisecond to wake up. That's a huge latency. So having so sometimes they have a user process just spinning, not letting the CPU go to sleep. Yes, it's going to burn electricity. You don't have to have ARC, kill climate change, and all that. But what you have is. You're spinning on uh, some memory space, and but the thing is, we say you have a microsecond latency. Well, this tick that goes off could take two, three microseconds to do that tick. So when the packet comes in and you're in the middle of a tick, you could be two, three microseconds latency where you just missed your deadline. And real time, there's a lot of some uh, real time developer systems that can't spare that. They need to be able to spin and not be interrupted by the kernel at all. So, what we're trying to do is we're working on, it's still not completely finished, is config no hertz full, which says, okay, when we have a single task running, we'll just turn off the tick and act like it's idle. There's a little bit more work because that guy's running. If it does system calls, system calls will trigger ticks. So, it's got to be running in user space. So, you got, if something's running fully in user space, we want to do that. So, what I did was I booted up my test box with this in the command line. Uh, no hertz, well, I enabled this. You have to tell what CPUs, there's different ways you can do all CPUs, but then this adds a bit of overhead too, so don't want to do this on all distributions. This is basically if you have a use case for it, if you have something where you really need to turn off ticks to monitor so the kernel doesn't bother you, you do this yourself, but on a general operating system, this is mostly going to be turned off. Um, so you add no hurts full. I did, I cheated, I saw CPUs, there's, you can use C, CPU sets, but it was just easier just to say ISO CPU. So you're trying to deprecate this. I think it's easier to do. So I just said these two, these CPUs two and three. What this is telling me is CPU two and three are not going to run on anything. So the current when the kernel boots up, it says, okay, these two CPUs, I'm not going to schedule anything on, except for things that have to, you know, the kernel threads that are per CPU. Those are still scheduled. But it won't, any user tasks in it or something will never, like when it forks, all the affinities for each task will have these two off. This RCU no callbacks is telling, telling the RCU, it's kind of, kind of like the garbage collector of the um, uh, Linux system, and it kicks off, uh, has call, callbacks that, uh, that kicks off threads and such. Um, it's saying don't run the callbacks on two or three. So if, even if two or three calls needs this garbage collection, it will then say, okay, if I need a thread or something, put it off on something that's on the other CPUs to handle it for two or three. Then I did, okay, let's do, after I booted this, I said, trace command record dash E all. It says, give me all events for one second. That's all I did. And this is what I got. So, up here, CPU zero, boom, is doing a lot of something. <clears throat> what the heck is that? CPU zero. Uh, CPU one is um, got some stuff going on. 
Say the two did a little bit of stuff. I'm like, that shouldn't have happened. Three did nothing, which is good. But two and three should have been completely empty. Anyway, I said, okay, let's just zoom in here and see what's going on. So I zoomed in. And that, that CPU zero is actually doing a lot of little things. It's not doing this, it's not spinning. You can see it's doing a little bit. I measured what's going on in CPU zero, and it actually, look at that, it's basically once a millisecond. So it looks like CPU zero is not no burst. It's actually running the tick constantly. It's not, CPU zero is not going to sleep. I debugging into it, like, why is that happening? I'm not sure. Sometimes CPU zero, sometimes no hertz doesn't work on all your CPUs. The other CPUs obviously aren't how you take, but yeah, that no hertz is not tricky. Tricky. Um, so let's put in a little spin, let's add something else. Let's put in a spinner. So I this I have this user spin, all it does is basically spins for 30, like the spin you pass on a parameter for 30 seconds. So it's doing nothing but it's only spin for 30 seconds. Um, I ran tasks, so basically here's the recorder. Uh, I'm gonna go back. Task that just says, okay, I want this guy to spin on CPU two. So set the affinity of CPU two. Although this kernel will not schedule anything on affinity, you can, you, you're allowed to say, run this on that CPU. So I say, okay, run it on CPU, test CPU. This, I'm gonna record something. I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna do the function graph tracer of ftrace of max def three. What that means is when, it will only trace three functions down. It will not trace more. I only care about the first few functions that are hit. I don't care about anything else. It's like, if I go into the kernel, I just want to see why I go into the kernel. There's some wrapper there. I first did, I usually do max def one, but the uh, no hertz full adds a wrapper around it, so all I got was the wrapper. <laughs> so, the, and then two, there's some another wrapper, I'm like, crap. So, to see what was actually happening, I had to go max step three to see, get down to actually, what, why did it go into the kernel? And this is what I got. A lot more, a lot, a lot busier. I mean, this is this is a basically an idle system here, but this guy's running like crazy, and you got a lot going on. Um, what I found out was this guy was pushing the RCU call, the RCU no callbacks. This guy actually caused RCU to trigger, pushing a bunch more RCU stuff going on inside here. Um, so I said, okay, first of all, I, don't, I clicked on CPUs up there. Let's see what the CPUs are. I applied it, because I only wanted to see these three CPUs, I, I, just to clear it up. Then I said, okay, let's apply, only to take off filters to graph. I don't quite care, I, I want those guys, so I want to filter this guy here. And I filter the CPUs on the, this guy here, so now I'm only going to see CPUs one, two, and three. I zoomed into this little spot, because this seems interesting. And this is what I got. There's a lot of stuff, I didn't really look deep detail into this, but then I looked, what the heck is going on here? when it's only a user space spinner. So I did a, I went actually here, I did a click here, and said look, here it's doing some B time. It's doing some uh, virtual time. It's updating a virtual time function call. Why, why is the virtual time happening on CPU too? I, I'm, not, I, I'm confused. Then I come down here and say wait, IRQ24 triggered here. Why is interrupt 24 triggered here? Guess what? ISO CPUs does not touch the interrupts. CPU two over here, we got you know a bunch of interrupts going off onto CPU two and CPU three. This is a local time interrupts which will go off when you add it. But so I'm like, okay, I have to do something for that. So okay, let's retry this. LS all the SMP, IRQ, SMP affinities while read I do echo F three. Um, it takes in a mask, CPU mask, so uh, three. So basically, it's usually FF. That's eight CPUs, zero through seven, uh, taking off a uh, bit. Uh, two and three, we just drop off bits, yeah, the first two bits, so that F turns into a three, echo it to whatever that thing is, run it, and I get this, uh, I did the same thing again. And it got much better. But what's kind of interesting here is I see, hey, this is a tick, work, tick, work, tick, work, tick, work, tick, work, tick, work, and I like, it's very, very, you know, formal. So I looked at this, and interesting enough, it's four seconds apart. Everyone happens in four seconds. Four seconds, four seconds, four seconds. And I can see it here. Let me go back here. I got the same user interface. And it's going in here, it's doing, if you read it, read it better up here. Here's the user spin, runtime. It's doing, oh, it's doing accounting. It's still doing accounting work. 
Remember I said no hurts are still in progress? <laughs> this is why it's still actually, there's some things that it still needs to be done, but we're able to say, hey, we won't go off all the time, we'll go off once every four seconds. <laughs> so yeah, your system happens, but we the chances of a collision right now is much less. There's work, there's patches out there to actually eliminate all this. So we're still working on it. It's, in a, it's still there, so yes, we need to fix that. So, kernel shark can be used to visualize that trace. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of um, filtering of events, and there'll be a lot more coming too. But the thing is, when kernel shark 1.0 got out, this is going to allow us to open up libraries. We plan on having a lib, lib k shark actually and to start working on kernel shark 2.0. This is why we're so excited to get 1.0 out because 2.0 is in the process. We have a lot of prototypes working. We're playing with it, trying different ideas. Um, we're going to have put, make it uh, a lot more plugins that so you can virtualize. We have uh, Python plugins. Uh, Jordan from his CERN work is familiar with NumPy. How many people are familiar with NumPy? Wow, okay. He's making a NumPy interface to uh, crunch numbers and crunch the data that of data traces. And we're working with people like uh, uh, Wolfgang Maurer, and he's talked about Jitter Debugger that's doing analysis on um, real-time tasks. And we're gonna be working with him to uh, try, there he is. <laughs> yep, we're gonna be working with him to uh, be able to uh, take these traces of gigabytes and crunch the numbers to try to prove statistically that we have uh, um, what the worst case execution time is, because the Linux is so complex and a lot of real-time com computers are so complex you can't do it really the old way. Uh, so we're working on that for it. And one thing that, I, oh, and better, record, uh, better recording features, um, tracing virtual machines with hosts. That's coming up, and I'll show you that in the slide. And libkshark, what he says, I'm working on something that's called the um, unified tracing platform, where I want, to get all tracers, uh, Babel trace, LTTNG, per, uh, perf, uh, ftrace, to have libraries that any tools, if you're writing a tool or you're writing a Python plugin or Perl, yes, I, I guess that's still out there, I like Perl, um, or Go, Java, whatever, have you get the interface and you need some sort of tracing and this tool or this library has that feature, I want you to share everyone to be able to take everyone's uh, tracing um, tool utilities and be able to use it anywhere. This is a community effort. This is something that why have competing uh, tracing algorithms where you could just say, hey, this guy does this part better, but I need this too that's done better here. Let's work and merge them together. And this is what Kernel Shark, I want to do in Kernel Shark 2.0 with virtual machines. And this is actually a screenshot of one of the prototypes. I didn't quite get it working because I got I couldn't get the uh, synchronization right again. So my machine is a little different than the machine that we ran this on. But ideally is you will record a agent, or you put an agent on each guest, and then from the host you can say, hey, record uh, this guest, record this guest, record this guest, and record the host, and then you can go and you can merge it, and you can say, okay, this thread here on the host, it actually represents this virtual CPU 4 from the guest, and then you can attach them, and it will show this to you. So this actually shows you that this is the events that happen on the guest, and obviously, when you're running as a guest, it's one CPU. So a host, there's a host thread that represents that virtual CPU for the guest. And you should never see two events at a time, because it's either running the guest or it's running the host mode. It's just a context switch, like running, running in user mode or running in uh, kernel mode. You have kernel mode, user mode, guest mode. And guest mode then has kernel mode and user mode. And this is inside the kernel of the guest. And then from here, you saw it, it actually exited the guest, went to the host, host had an uh, event, came back to the guest. Here was a longer, so you can actually measure times between like how, how long these things were. Then you can see, so say if somebody, a host is blocked on something and you want to see why the guest is slow, you actually do this and you see a visualization of, ah, the problem's in the host, not the guest. Or you can say, ah, the problem's in the guest, don't blame the host provider. Well, actually, I have one minute, so I guess I'm not doing a demo, but thank you. <laughs>